Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's HBO's original series, Watchmen. Season one, episode three, entitled, She Was Killed by Space Junk. What an exciting, detail-packed, Easter egg-dropping episode. I'll do the recap of the entire episode with the review at the end. That's all coming up next. <laughs> It's Bunny. <laughs> Opening scene, we see a woman. She's in a telephone booth-esque compartment, and we hear a long series of telephone keynotes. Do, do. And on the screen, we see, welcome to True Connections. Your signal is now being transmitted to Mars. Your signal has now been received on Mars. You are now speaking with Dr. Manhattan. And as she's about to speak, we know that this scene is a montage of her voiceover blended with the current scene. So we hear her voice say, I got a joke. Stop me if you've heard this one. And we see that a woman is getting out of a car. She's going into the bank. She's going to the direct deposit counter. She's filling out a deposit slip. She's going to the counter. As she's doing this, we hear the woman's voice who's on the phone. And she says, here's the joke. There is a master bricklayer, and he's very good, and he's very precise about bricklaying. And on top of that, he has a daughter, and he wants to teach the daughter how to bricklay because every master has their apprentice, or every master build, builder wants a legacy. He teaches her, and one day there is this structure, and he looks at the structure, and it's beautiful. And he thinks it's a wonderful creation. There's only one problem. He sees that there's one brick left over. And the bricklayer says, something has got to be wrong. Because there's one brick left. So we've got to start all over. We've got to tear this down. And as the bricklayer goes forward to tear down the structure and to just destroy it all, the daughter says, wait. And she picks up the orphan brick and throws it into the air and, 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 and the woman over the phone says, ah, I messed that one up. Let me tell you another one. So we get out of that voiceover montage and we see the woman is at the front counter. It's the same one who's making the call. And she says, everybody put their hands up and she has a gun and she releases some shots into the air and everybody in the bank is getting down and taking cover and we see that there are some cops that are in the bank and they're starting to point their guns at the woman that's robbing the bank and all of a sudden we see this vigilante come up from the ceiling and drop down and tells her to stop what she's doing and the woman that's robbing the bank says how did you know I would be here? Did you get a tip? Did someone call you? Did you speak with the FBI? Because if you spoke with the FBI, then they would have let you know, they would have told you that why I was gonna be here. And if they told you that I was gonna be here, then that would be proving that what you're doing is against the law. Because being a vigilant a vigilante is a crime. And the guy that's in the costume is like, dang it. And he begins to take off. And as he proceeds to run, she starts to shoot the vigilante in the back. And he drops to the ground. He goes through the glass and he drops to the, to the ground. And one of the cops says, man, how did you know his armor was bulletproof? She gives that look like, I could care less. And clearly, she didn't know that his armor would stop bullets. And when she goes outside, there are protesters out there and they're saying, why are you doing this? He's a hero. Why are you stopping him? And she turns to him and says, he's not a hero. 
He's far from that. And we see that she is an FBI agent. This lady FBI agent, she's come to her apartment and she's bringing her day to a close. She tells her electronic device to play Devo and it starts to play. She has a mouse that she drops into a cage and she covers the cage. And then she hears a knock at the door. And when she goes to the door, she says, oh, Senator Kane. And he says, oh yes, Detective Blank. I just wanted to come and congratulate you on catching the Revenger. And she says, it's not the Revenger, it's Revenger. And that was last week. Today it was Mr. Shadow. And he says, well, yes, right. I just wanted to come and thank you on behalf on tax dollars. We definitely thank you. He goes on to explain to Agent Blake that you are helping because you are stopping rich vigilantes who are really playing dress up, who are walking around like they're heroes. And he goes over to the other side of the room and he opens up the cage and we see this beautiful owl inside with these beautiful eyes. And he says, Agent Blake, so what's his name? And she says, who? And he says, the owl, what's the owl's name? She goes, who? Why don't you ask him what his name is? And he brushes that off and he tells her, look, the deputy director wants you to come to Tulsa to investigate why this chief of police has been hung. And she says, you mean hanged? He says, well, yeah. So normally we would suspect the 7th Calvary will be guilty of this. But 7th Calvary, they take pride in killing cops. And after this happened, we didn't hear a peep. So we're suspecting that this could be a vigilante of some sort. Maybe they were jealous of him and the way that he climbed the ranks. And she says, well, I did warn you about the dangers of them being masks. And not only masks, but in bright yellow ones. And he tells her, okay, I get it. But ever since DOPA, she says, no, wait. You called the new act DOPA? He says, yes, it's the, it's the Defense of the Police Act. Defense of Police Act. And she says, well, you know, go on. He says, okay, look, no matter what the name is, the act is keeping police officers safe. And it's dropped by 80%. So we've got to keep this going. Even other cities have adapted this practice. And if this happens, if this continues and we don't find any information, it could start a war. And she emphasizes, oh, because if a war started, then you wouldn't get to be president. And he says, Lori, so we know her name is Lori Blake. If I were president, a lot of things can happen and I can make sure that that owl can come out of its cage. She leans her head back like, oh. Like she really doesn't want to do this assignment. And as the camera pans out, we see that a painting behind her shows her and other watchmen when they were younger. And she said, oh, Oklahoma. We have the next montage scene who we know now is Lori. She's on that same phone call. And it's a voiceover going into the next scene of her getting dressed and getting ready to go to the FBI building in order to be informed about this case in Tulsa, Oklahoma, her briefing. And she says on the phone, okay, next joke. Hmm, you got three heroes that died and they are all standing at the pearly gates waiting on their fates, their eternal fates. And the first hero steps up to the gate and God says, I gave you talent. What did you do with that talent? And the owl says, well, I made an amazing ship. I created weapons and outfits all to help humanity. And God says, well, how many people did you kill? And the owl says, none, none at all. And God says, that's a shame. You were too soft. And he snaps his finger and sends the owl straight to hell. And then the next scene, we see Lori, she's sitting down in the meeting. Everybody else is there. She's kind of coming a little late and they're having a briefing on what has happened in Tulsa. The lead FBI agent, he's in front of the room giving the briefing to all of the agents. And he says, we got 7th Cavalry, you guys. And they're following that Custer crap that from back in the day, but who cares? They're clans people with different masks on. Okay, and this all started when we had the Violence Act that was passed, people who were the victims of that, uh, who received the redfordations, 
and people of color, they started to have their own businesses and buy land. And unfortunately, white people, they have a problem when people of color start to prosper. So what ended up happening is they started to take out these individuals and cops who protected them. So the cops in response had to start taking away weapons of people who are associated with the supremacist group. And they had to start drawing down the line and investigating maybe people who were in involved with them or orchestrated with them. And as he's going through the slides, he sees a written expert and he excerpt and he looks at one of the assistants that's running the slides and he goes, what the hell is this? And the guy that's assisting running the slides, he says, well, this is an excerpt from the Rorschach journals and the people of 7th Cavalry, they read this journal and they refer to it. So I thought for psychological purposes that we needed to have this up. And he says, well, no, no, no. What is this, the 1980s? Take this down. It's just a stupid journal. And he goes on and he says, we need to start. And this is what you're going to be reviewing in Tulsa. So we're going to have Blake, Agent Blake, and we're going to have you to go with each other to investigate. And Lori says, no, 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 no. I'm going solo because if we start to drop down a lot of FBI agents, it's going to throw up a lot of red flags and I kind of need to be discreet with this. And he says, well, you got to take somebody. And he says, and Lori says, I take him. And she points to the guy that mentioned the Rorschach uh, journal. So she has an idea of saying that you may not agree with this guy, but she's very observant to know that he did his research and he backtracked about Seven Calvary and how this may correlate in some form with the research when they go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So she says, I'm taking him with me. So we have agent Lori Blake and the FBI agent that she's chosen to go with her to Tulsa, Tulsa Oklahoma. She's awakened from a nap on the jet and we hear the pilot say, if you look out the window, you can see the millennial clock. And the guy looks out of the window and he says, look ye all my works, ye mighty and despair. And Lori goes, what? And he says, oh, that was what Lady True said, um, you know, when she bought the company from Adrian Veidt. But I think you knew him back in the day as Quasimantis. You know, it's rumors are going around that he had plastic surgery and he's incognito, you know, neato. And she looks at him and says, what do you want me to sign? Goes, excuse me she says what do you want me to sign because apparently you're a fan and you love looking into the past and he says well I don't need you to treat me like a fan because before I became an FBI agent you know I was a history teacher for years and before the FBI chose me before you chose me that is what I was doing before so don't treat me like a fan and she gives him that look like okay I can give you a little respect but Watch it still. We have the voiceover montage of Lori continuing to tell this joke of hero number two. And as she's talking about hero number two, we see different shots and scenes of Lori and the agent that is with her. They go to the crime scene of where Chief Judd was hanged. They're taking pictures of anything that might have been overlooked by the cops there in Tulsa. They are going to the widow's house. They're going to all of these different locations. And we hear the voiceover say, hero number two gets to the pearly gates. And this is Mr. Smarty Pants. And he figures that he has this in the bag. And God says, well, what did you do with your talent? And he says, well, what I did is I dropped a giant squid in New York and it made people so focused on the squid that people forgot to hate each other. So people started to get along. And God says, well, how many people did you kill? And hero number two says, about three million. And God says, Christ, you're a monster. And he proceeds to snap his fingers and send Mr. Smarty Pants to hell. Lori has found the location where the cops take uh, different suspects to be investigated. And as she comes up to this abandoned factory, she sees two cops and they have a guy. And she walks up and says, well, who are you? And the cop says, well, who are you? And she says, well, I'm FBI agent Lori Blake. And she says to the suspect that's on the ground, excuse me, sir, are your civil rights being violated and he says well yes I, I i was at my place and they took me and they dragged me here she says you know what i don't even care 
I'm really just trying to find Looking Glass. Has anybody seen Looking Glass? And the masked cops, they look at her like, yeah, he's in here. As Lori goes in, she's noticing the inhumane procedures that the cops have when they bring in these suspects. There's dogs, it's cold, it's at an abandoned factory, it's not at an, uh, a police agency or anything like that. And she says, you know, this is all fine and great, but I'm looking for a looking glass. Where is he? And one of the cops says, well, he's in the pod. She goes to the pod and she sees a guy that has this mirror-esque mask on. And he tells her that they can speak in the pod. Or he says, oh, well, I noticed that you have different images on the wall. So I'm guessing this is your racist detector. And he says, it's not a racist detector. She leans into his face and says, hmm. oh, excuse me. When you wear, you know, something like that, that's like a mirror, you know, people can't help but to use it. Can I ask you a few questions, Wade? Or do you prefer Detective Tillman? So she's letting him know, I know who you are, okay? We're going to talk about this here. Or we're going to talk about it soon or eventually. So he sits down and he says, yes. And he lifts up the mask to, you know, indicating, you know my name. So it's quite evident, you know who I am. You know what I look like. So he lifts up the mask. She asked Wade how they came about the information concerning the cattle ranch because they had to get that information some way, somehow. And he tells her that Angela, she questioned the suspect. And she says, by question, you pretty much meant beat up pretty much is what you meant. So you have, okay, Angela Abar, AKA Sister Knight, she got this information, correct? And Wade is very hesitant, like, hmm, I don't know if I should say anything. And Lori says, I just need to know where she is so I can ask her a few questions. Where, questions, where is she? And he says, she's actually on her way to judge, judge funeral. And Lori says, well, I guess I better wear something darker. We see another montage scene of more of a voiceover concerning hero number three and Lori and all of the different cops and agents funneling into this funeral for judge, cars parking, Angela coming out, her husband, the kids, and the voiceover says, hero number three, he's all blue. He walks around with his thing out all the time and he can teleport and see the future. And he gets to the pearly gates and God asks, so what did you do with your talents and your gifts? And the guy that's all blue says, I walked across the sun. I fell in love with a woman. And then I fell in love with another woman. And then I ended the Vietnam War. And to be honest, I really don't care about humanity. And God says, well, what should I do with you? Where should I send you? And he says, well, you're God and I can see the future. And I already know where you're going to send me. And God says, well, where? He says, you're going to send me to hell. And God says, well, how do you know? And he says, because I'm already there. God snaps his fingers and sends hero number three straight to hell. Lori, she walks up to Angela and says, well, hi, Angela. And Angela looks surprised, like, how does this woman know me? And she says, oh, well, hi, Cal. And she turns to her husband and shakes his hand. And he looks really shocked. And it's a deceptive look because we don't know if he's seen her, if he's heard of her, if he knows her, but he more has a shocked and a oh no look rather than, oh, who's this talking to me? And, but anyway, she keeps going and Cal says, well, do I know you? She says, no, 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 I just found out the information because I found out that you guys were good friends of, you know, Judd's family and I just wanted to introduce myself. And she proceeds to hand Angela a card and Angela says, well, I'm not a cop anymore. And she goes, right. He asks uh, Angela, do you know the difference between a mass vigilante and a cop? Angela says, no. She says, I don't either. The funeral starts to begin. And we have Judd's now widow. She goes up to the front. And she starts to make her speech. And says, you know, there's several things that I can say about him. And I could go on and on and on. But Angela, I would really appreciate it if you come up to the front and say some kind words. And as she comes up to the front, we see that Lori is very observant. She's looking around. 
She's looking at people, seeing how they're reacting. She's not there for the funeral. She could care less. She's trying to see what the heck is going on. And as she proceeds to talk, Angela is saying that there's a lot of memories that we've shared. He knew me when I used to be a cop before I retired. And we also knew what to say about each other in the time of our passing at each other's funeral. And as she goes on, to speak, she begins to sing. And Lori gives that look like, okay. And she slowly starts to clap, developing the melody of the song that Angela is singing. While that's happening, we hear the sound of ticking, the watchman tick, tick, tick. And as a viewer, we're like, what is about to happen? Because we know this is the indicator, uh-oh. We see someone with a Rajak mask on underground and they're going through this tunnel. And as they're going through this tunnel, we have Angela, she's still singing this song and everybody's clapping along with what she's singing at the funeral. And he, this, this Rajak guy comes out of the ground and he wants everybody to see him, that he has a device in his hand and he has a bomb device on his chest. And he says, I'm calling out you, Senator Kane. You are a race traitor and I need you to come with me. And if you don't come with me, it's going to be some problems. And Angela, she sees this going on and she's still trying to keep her calm demeanor because she doesn't want to let the cat out the bag that she can, you know, do a little something, something. And she's trying to act meek and like, oh, I'm so scared. And people are starting to get scared, scared and rattled. And the terrorist guy says, Senator Kane, I need you to come with me. And if anybody else tries to harm me, this bomb goes off of my heart rate. And as soon as I'm gone, this bomb will blow up. And Senator Kane says, okay, whatever it takes, just, just remain calm and I'll come with you. He starts to make his way over to the guy and they're standing side by side. And Senator Kane is just like, I just need everybody to stay calm and pow. And then we see Lori, she ain't got time for that. She took a sharpshooter shot and took the guy out. And we got the senator that's just standing there like, oh, he just he's just in shock looking at all the brain splatter and all the blood that's on him. And Angela says, run, because clearly this guy is about to die and this bomb is about to go off. So everybody starts to run and everybody starts to take cover. And as they're doing that, we hear a beeping on the bomb of his heart rate going down. Do, do. Do, do, do. So we only got so much longer before this bomb explodes and Angela drags his body and pulls his body and throws him into the open area in the ground where Judd would have been buried, throws him in there and then pushes the casket on top. This way when there is an explosion that the casket and it being so deep, that will take majority of the impact of the bomb. After it explodes, we have Lori and Angela on the ground looking at each other with eye contact like, wow, what just happened? And Angela gives that head shake like, I have no idea what the heck is going on. Someone is listening to Megaton Dove 2 by Lee Perry. And if you're a comic book reader, you have an idea who this is, just like Lori. But he is making things. He's designing stuff. He's uh, making outfits. He's curing and drying out his own leather. Uh, we see structures that are being created. And it's the same gentleman that we've seen in episodes one and two who's been in this desolate place uh, out somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But he is busy and he is getting to it. There are Easter eggs of who he is with the purple mask and so many different hints and clues. But with this series, they are giving us everything in increments. So we see this guy staying busy. I mean, and he is into it and he's having fun and he's just so focused on finishing and creating and doing what he's doing. One of the things that he's creating, we see that he's developing some type of experiment and he's created this armor and this outfit for one of his clones to try on. And after he has all of the items on the clone, he says, well, are you ready to go above and beyond? <laughs> 
and he says, yes, master, I'm ready. So he's getting everything ready. He has the rope. And unfortunately, we can tell that this experiment didn't go quite well because the next scene we see that the clone is frozen. And this can give us, a, give us an idea that he didn't make it as far as he wanted him to be. Uh, he only got so far out of the Earth's atmosphere before he froze and came all the way down. And he's very upset about that. He's kicking the clone and he's punching it and he's just like... <sighs> Okay, and he gets himself together and he collects himself and says, I think we need thicker skin. So as he gets on his horse, we see him gallop to somewhere where we see a field of buffalo. And he aims at the field of buffalo and he takes a shot, gets off his horse, he's taken down a buffalo. And as he proceeds to get his arrow, we see this shot at his feet. And in the distance, we have a masked horseman and he's holding his gun and he's looking at him dead in the eye, like telling him to stop. And he gets back on his horse and he heads back home and we see him meditating on his desk, sitting there trying to refocus. And one of the clones comes in and says, Master, you've received a letter. And he says, well, go on with it. And she says, well, dear mister, he's like, yes, 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 you know, forget all the formalities, get to the crust of the letter. And she says, well, yes, um, this email, this email, this letter is to inform you that we have parameters and agreements about while you're staying here and rules and what you've been doing recently. Some of your activity has violated those agreements. And I'm letting you know that that has to stop now. And next time. I won't just shoot at your feet. There will be consequences. So please make sure that you, you know, follow those guidelines and that you don't keep doing some bogus stuff. He comes out of meditation and says, get the typewriter. We're about to send him a letter back. And he <laughs> sends a letter to this, this, this warden to tell him, I know you're probably thinking that the activity that I'm doing is criminal-esque or some criminal behavior, but I can guarantee you that's not what's going on. And if you have any questions about what I'm doing, feel free to come to me face to face and we can talk about it and we can discuss this and all of this is necessary. So he looks into the camera and he says, sincerely, Adrian Vite. So we know who he is. And I'm at home like, oh. I knew who you were, but I just wanted you to say it. I'm like, oh, here we go. We learned it all the characters. So we like, okay, we know that's Adrian. Thank God. So he makes it known who he is. And he tells that clone, you make sure to let Mr. Phillips know that we're going to suit up and boot up and we're going to go back out for a hunt at midnight. Because he basically said, whatever was said in that letter, I could care less. I'm going to suit up, boot up, and we about to go. And we see him in the mirror. And he puts on the purple disguise with the costume. And we know who this is now. For those of you that are newbies, the detail will come in. But we are learning everybody slowly but surely. But now we know who Lori is. And now we know who Adrian is. So what an adrenaline rush for the comic book readers. Next scene, we see Senator Kane. He's standing there still with blood splattered on his suit and he is surrounded by reporters. And he says, oh, I'm glad that everyone's okay. And I'm not the heroes here. The true heroes are the cops and everybody that was around to defuse the situation. So gladly everyone is okay. And he's giving that look like, <laughs> and a reporter says, are you aware that Russia is trying to develop an intrinsic uh, fusion generator? Um, and he says, look, you know, I'm focused on Tulsa, Oklahoma. My priorities are here. The war is here. There's a war developing. So he's put it out there and he says there's a war, which is a red flag in the wording. And, ooh, Senator Kane, did we really want to put this out there? But he blows off that detail and he puts the focus back on him. And he says, there's this war. My focus is on the war here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I could care less about Russia, what Russia is doing. So that is a big red flag and just swaying off that question that the reporter asked. But Lori is looking across like this guy. Lori goes to the crime scene in which we just had the explosion 
and she gets the coffee that her assistant bought, brought for her, but she takes both cups, one for her and one for Angela, and she goes back to the area where Angela is still looking at the information herself. And Angela comes out of this hole once again with these goggles that allow her to see through walls. And Lori says, well, what did you find? And she said, well, this tunnel goes right outside um, the cemetery. So clearly they had to have some high powered tunnel, you know, drills to get through all of this, but they did it. And Lori goes on to describe in saying that it's unfortunate, you know, that the explosion happened, but we were planning on digging up Judd for more information. And don't you find this interesting that after a homicide that they did an autopsy or they had a funeral so quickly that that, that doesn't seem odd to you? And also, I know we're talking about 7 Calvary, but you also need to keep your mind open to all possibilities. She's letting Angela know don't be naive and she tells her that i know it's hard doing a case in which the victims are people that you know and that's why i'm here i'm here to help you out and help you guys look into what you possibly overlooked so she's letting them know look i know y'all are sloppy y'all are not even thinking about other uh, aspects or things or people that could have done this so she's letting her know like girl open your eyes and speaking of that, there are some details that I noticed that uh, you guys overlooked. Uh, for one, by the tree, there were tracks. And they weren't just tracks. They were, you know, tracks from a wheelchair. And Angel goes, oh, you know, she's trying to act super surprised, like, oh, from a wheelchair. She says, yeah, from a wheelchair. And also what I thought was crazy that Judd's wife, you know, said that, you know, there was a chamber or there was like a hidden cabinet or something in their closet don't you find that interesting she goes well Angela acts confused like why would somebody keep something in their closet like what are you talking about she says oh it's just something that I learned and you know when someone special to me passed away that they had secret compartments in their closet too and she says Angela you know what do you think was in that secret compartment and Angela goes how should I know and she says, Angela, I just want to let you know that guys or someone that was perceived to be a good guy and all this stuff has happened and the next thing we know he's hanging from a tree, those aren't good guys. But what's the worst is people who think that they're good guys. They protect them. But I just want to let you know that I eat good guys for breakfast. And Angela goes in this sarcastic dam damsel in uh, distress reaction. Oh. <laughs> Giving an indication like, boo, was I supposed to be scared because you just told me that? <laughs> and Angela gets that cup of coffee that, that Lori brought her and she just, just pours it out like I could care less about what you have to say. And of course, Angela would have that reaction because she doesn't know who to trust. And the only thing she can go off of is what she knows and that the people that she knows. The last montage that we have, a voiceover connected with the scene, Lori and the other FBI agent, they're heading back to the hotel and we hear the voiceover of, so all three of the heroes have been sent to hell. And God is packing up all his stuff and he's about to call it a day. And we see that Lori, she's going back to her, her, her hotel room and she opens up the suitcase and we see something special that she has in this suitcase uh, that deeply reminds her of Dr. Manhattan so much so that she's intrigued to go next door to the other agent's room and they have sex. So clearly it entices her. But the voiceover continues and says, that as God is getting ready to go, he sees a woman and he says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't see you there. And she goes, well, I've been here the whole time. I was behind all three of these heroes. God says, well, I usually don't do this, but I don't even know who you are. And I'm quite embarrassed to say that. And the woman says, I'm the girl who threw the brick in the air. And as she says that, God looks up and a brick comes down and proceeds to make his head explode and brains go all over the place. 
And the story ends by her saying, and where do you think God goes when he dies? Straight to hell. Ha ha, drum roll, rim shot. We see Lori, she's still in the true phone booth and she says, I just don't, I don't know why I still come to, this, to these booths and tell you jokes. I mean, you can't even hear me. And, and you've been away on Mars for 30 years, so what is the point? I know it's stupid, and, and you don't even understand jokes. And you don't even have a good sense of humor, so why am I even doing this? And she says, you know, I guess, John, that it gives me some sort of imagination and some sort of, of fun and excitement to talk to you. And she says, good night, John. And she hangs up. And as she leaves the booth, she's walking and she hears a noise. And she hears something coming down and all of a sudden we see this big crash of a car. And Lori is like, what in the world is going on? And she looks up into the sky and there's this small burst of orange light, of a shadow of orange light. And, and it's sort of giving the indication that this came from Mars. And she looks up like, holy crap. And we can make a good guess that Dr. Manhattan was showing her, oh no, I heard you. And I heard every single word. And Lori can't help but to stand there and historically laugh about what just happened. And that is the end of the episode. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you in the recaps and the review for episode one and two to let the series take its time? Didn't I say that? Didn't I say that to allow the writers to take you on this journey and slowly learn who is who? And that I had a, a thought that that was the direction of the writing, that they wanted you to sit back be patient and learn everybody slowly and surely because if they just flood you with all of this information at one time, names, uh, dates, what happened after the comic book ended, your brain would be on overload and you'd be like, this show is just too much and you wouldn't watch it. The suspense of pulling you in slowly and letting you know who everybody is is so much more entertaining. The same ride and journey with game of thrones and slowly learning who everyone is because we had all of the locations to learn and who was who and all of this other stuff so i do like the fact that this series is taking you on a journey even if you've never read the comic books even if you never saw the movie um once again for those of you that have not watched the review and recaps of episodes one and two, please do so, so this all can make sense. I'll make sure to put the links below. Um, exciting. It pulls you in. The fact that it's episode three, and it's only going up to episode nine, it's just gonna get better and better and better. And I'm like, wow, this is episode three and every episode has been absolutely amazing. And I'm so intrigued and I'm so excited finally. There hasn't been a show in a while where I'm excited and I'm counting down to when it starts. Like I miss that on TV uh, so much. So let me know what you thought of this episode did you like it did you did you not like it and if you didn't like it please give me give me specifics um but let me know uh it's more suspenseful and fun if you allow the series to take its time and not google and look up everything of who who's playing who because it takes out the journey of what these writers are doing if you're open-minded and receptive it could be very entertaining give a show a chance first before you leap into oh my god this sucks <laughs> like give that time you've done it before with several other shows keep doing it uh i can only imagine how this is gonna ramp up who are the vigilantes who are the patriarchs who are the bad guys who are the good guys it's feeding us all of that information very slowly um yeah, that's about it. Um, I also received messages from those people um, who would say, why are you doing the review like this? I don't like the way you've done it. If you want people that dump all the information 
on you at one time. There are other channels that do that. I really think it's more exciting and exci insightful to do it the way that I'm doing it. And also the fun and creativeness of storytelling and recapping the episodes because not everybody has HBO and not everybody has opportunity to watch it. And some people who have watched it, they just want to hear it again. And then when we do the reviews, we want to see if we agree or disagree on some things and how the show is evolving. Let me know what you think. Check out uh, the premiere episode of my podcast show, The Bunny Show, uh, entitled You're So Not Okay, discussing mental health, social media, and how to create your journey and making sure that you're okay and you're living to your greatest potential. Make sure to have that um, listen when you can. Uh, subscribe. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss any posts. And also follow me on Instagram. Graham, Graham. My Texas accent came out. And follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, official bun underscore e tongue twister. Bye.